All right. Good morning and welcome to the worship services of the First Congregational Church of South Beacon. We're so glad many of you could join us live this morning at 9 a.m., actually before 9, so that you could catch some of the worship music that we share with one another uh, via Zoom. And then once we come at 9 o'clock, we are able to share with one another, encourage one another, share some prayer requests, pray together as a church family. And now we are to the portion where we actually hit record so that we can publish to both Facebook and YouTube. Uh, so that we can share our church with the world. I also want to encourage those of you that may be with us live uh, that you can always come back to this recording, again, via YouTube or Facebook, uh, to maybe dive into some devotionals throughout the week or remind ourselves of the things that we talked about as we strive to learn and grow closer to God. Because the reality is, in our human nature, uh, we forget things. And it's easy to, to kind of hear it one time and maybe be encouraged or inspired or challenged. But then when it gets put on the shelf and we move on with our life, it's easy to forget. It's easy to move on. Uh, but if we want to sink some of these concepts in that we are learning from God's word over the, over the weeks and months that we've been online and recording, we can always go back and revisit them. And we've actually built a library now. We've been doing this since March of 2020. So almost a full year of weekly installments, if you will, uh, that we can go back to and, and learn from and listen to. And just want to encourage you, if you're looking for a, a devotional source, that might be something that would be helpful. Uh, but we're gathered today uh, for the sake of just putting us back in the present, January 17th, 2021. And we are going to read some scripture together, pray together, and then hear a message uh, of hopefully encouragement um, and uh, just in, a, in the right sense, a challenge to us to, to learn how to apply God's word and to move forward in this life, praising him and honoring him with it. So let's start by reading our scripture together today. We're going to read out of Psalm chapter 142. If uh, you have a Bible in front of you, Psalm 142 is somewhere really close to the middle of the Bible. And we're going to read the entire chapter together. It's not very long. Psalm 142, starting in verse 1. I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before him my complaint. Before him, I tell my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. In the path where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. Look and see, there is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. I cry to you, O oh Lord. I say you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Set me free from my prison, that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. Again, that was Psalm 142. Would you please pray with me? Gracious God and Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Precious Holy Spirit, thank you for this glorious day, for the beautiful new fallen snow, for the crisp, clean air, for the fact that most of us were able to just get up this morning and breathe and move and be, that you've called some of us together this morning to hear your word and to be together. Others, you're going to call to witness this and to participate on the recordings. But Father, you have in your divine way brought us together despite the fact that we can't be in the same room together right now. And though we lament that reality, we also praise the fact, Father, that you are working in and through all of this for your kingdom's sake and for your glory. Father, as we enter into this time of hearing from you and, and uh, a kind of a guided message of learning, I pray, Heavenly Father, that your spirit would 
bathe over us. That our hearts and our minds would be receptive to what we're about to talk about. And where I may misspeak or misstep, that you would overcome that, Father, and really bring us to the place of understanding that you would like us to be. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The timing details are a bit fuzzy for me. I believe it was my senior year of high school. It was a varsity game of basketball, and toward the end of a close game, I got fouled on a shot. Which, of course, if you know basketball, means that it was my turn to shoot two free throws. At that point in time, I was a, a mediocre basketball player, kind of okay, not great. My abilities and confidence didn't peak until about four years later in college intramural ball, but hey, I was playing varsity and enjoying it, but I had to go to the line. As I went to the line in this closed game because of my known skill level, I was extremely nervous. And there's hardly a moment in sports when one could feel more alone. With the stands full of things, and nine other players within spitting distance it didn't matter. It was me alone at the line, and nobody could do anything to help me. Nervous and alone with less than perfect coordination, I shot the first shot, not knowing whether or not it would go in. At the moment that the ball went through the bottom of the net, I did the strangest thing. I took my own feet out from underneath myself and I fell to the floor on my back. It was a weird solo celebration that on one hand was a complete release of all that nervous tension that I was feeling. But on the other hand, it was an illustration of just how alone I felt in the moment. I forgot about the few hundred people in the room and the players all around me and the fact that we were in a live game and I just completely let go. Very quickly, though, I realized everyone was there with me. Slightly embarrassed, I popped up and shot the second shot. And I have no idea whether or not that second shot went in. A few weeks ago, I was on the phone with someone close to our congregation. She's in her 90s, but normally very active and full of life. On this day, though, there was a little less pep in her step. I quickly learned that she was on the tail end of her bout with COVID-19. I was a bit scared for her at first because, I mean, she, she's in her 90s. But she quickly assured me that she was on the upswing and doing much better, though it had been a rough road for her. But she had a confession for me. She's lived a long life with the standard ups and downs, the trials and tribulations, and the incredible stories of major difficulty that many of us face on our journey. And she said to me, with all seriousness and with the directness that can only come through someone who has deep meaning in their voice, she said, Pastor, in all my years on this earth, with these COVID restrictions and all that's been going on, I have never felt so lonely. As she said that last word, I could just, I could Feel it. There was such weight to her statement. Here is someone that was born in the 1920s. She experienced World War II in her teens 
and has lived through some of the most difficult times in our nation's history. She survived cancer for many years and has dealt with major loss in her life. And she didn't just state it once. She began to emphasize it heavily as if she were getting pummeled in a prize fight. People were still calling her occasionally. And she was being taken care of in her sickness. But her normal lifestyle of being out and about and engaging with the communities that she serves came to an abrupt halt and had no end in sight. And the emotional impact was having a devastating effect on her. I have never felt so lonely. Two different stories, two different emotional feelings. At the free throw line, I was alone. But on the other end of the phone line, my friend was lonely. And in today's message, I would like to explore how you and I might learn to deal with the reality of being alone at the line while fighting the temptation to be lonely. Being alone at the line is, is just, it's a part of life. It happens. How do we deal with that? How do we, how do we wrestle with that? How do we appreciate that in some cases while fighting the temptation to feel the emotional weight of loneliness? We've got a couple disclaimers as we enter into this conversation. First of all, I am not a doctor. And there are places in this conversation where one might be needed. I in no way want to oversimplify the complexity and in some cases the severity of the situation. I don't mean to pretend that there's some formula just to make it all go away. We are complex beings integrated, and unique. And we don't necessarily respond well to cookie-cutter solutions. That's disclaimer number one. Disclaimer number two. I do not recall any times in my life where I personally have struggled with the weight of loneliness. I am sure that those times have existed but honestly, I don't remember that. That doesn't make empathy impossible, but it does make me sensitive to the delivery of today's conversation. I don't want to imply that I've got this figured out. That is not at all the, the position of this, this conversation. Because in the realms I'm about to discuss briefly with you, I realize that everything can turn on a dime. And life can change for any one of us at any moment. I get that. That I have experienced. With those two disclaimers out of the way, I'd like to quickly distinguish a difference and cover a couple key strategies for strengthening our ability to be alone at the line while fighting the temptation to feel lonely. First, let's distinguish the fact that to be alone is a physical state of being. Okay. And to feel lonely is an emotional state of being. That's the key difference between the two. To be alone is a physical state, and to be lonely is an emotional state. Even in the midst of that crowded gym, I was alone at the line. Nobody, nobody by rule is allowed within that semicircle but the shooter. Nobody can shoot the shot for you. And back in my day, there's my aging phraseology again, but back in my day, when you shot a free throw, the gym went completely silent. It was a respect thing. It was, 
It was out of just respect for someone who was concentrating at the line. So not only did, are you alone in that semicircle, you, there's no sound going on. Now, I know that doesn't happen in today's game, but when I was playing in the 80s, that was still etiquette, and it was silent in the gym. I was physically and logically alone. But loneliness is a completely different animal. It's an overwhelming emotional state, and emotions can be tricky animals. You can be in the midst of a hug, a physical hug, and feel lonely. It doesn't matter your physical state, because loneliness is an emotional state. They come on us whenever we li- whether we like them or not, these emotions. And if we don't learn how to wrangle them, to keep them under control, they can wreak havoc on our lives. Now, we can't always control the physical nature of being alone. That's going to happen in our lives, sometimes by choice, many times not. The two strategies, though, that I want to discuss deal with this idea of learning how to navigate the emotional temptation of loneliness that can come on us at any time. And we really don't have any control over it coming on us. We can only control how we respond to it. So strategy number one is to pursue holistic health. Strategy number one is to pursue Holistic health. Now, holistic means comprehensive, all well-rounded, etc. And I want to speak through four different elements of that holistic health specifically because they all have an impact on our ability to deal with these emotions when they hit us. And the first one I want to talk about is physical health. Have you ever heard of the toothache principle? The idea behind the toothache principle is I, if I have a bad toothache, it does not matter what go, is going on around me. I have a hard time. I'm going to have a hard time dealing with life. I'm going to bark at anybody that gets in my way until I can get that fixed. It has just this incredible way of throwing all <laughs> uh, empathy and etiquette and r- rules of engagement out the window. It is really hard to be emotionally strong when we are physically hurting. It can be almost impossible. Now, many of us can do something about that. We can do things to improve our physical health. They don't have to be huge, big things. We don't have to go work out six and seven days a week. But we all know that there are two key things that that contribute to our health, either positively or negatively. And they fall under the, the realm of diet and exercise. And I know people don't like to hear that. I get that. I mean, we've heard that all of our lives. But there is absolute truth in it. For many of us, not all of us, for many of us, for most of us, we have direct influence on our physical health by paying attention to what we put in our mouths and how we move our bodies. And if we want to prepare ourselves, our holistic health, for being able to manage the emotions that come on us without our, our just out of the blue, and the one we're talking about particularly today is this emotion of loneliness, We've got to take care of ourselves physically. We need to be healthy physically. Now, the second one that I want to talk about briefly is our emotional health. Like our physical health, this is an entire field of study that we do not have time to dive deeply into. And quite frankly, I'm not qualified to do so because of some of the elements that are involved in here but we cannot ignore it. So I have to at least mention it as a part of this holistic approach to health. 
Understanding that it is an entire field of study is a step in the right direction. It should clue us into the importance of learning more about it so that we can improve it. Just like we can measure our physical health by, you know, forgive me, but just a couple things off the top of my head. We, we can count the number of push-ups we can do. We can tell how, how far we can go before we have to take a rest. We can measure our, our blood oxygen rate. We can measure, measure our recovery. There are ways to measure our physical health. There are also ways to measure our emotional health. It all gets boiled down into a, an EQ, an emotional quotient. And some of us are very emotionally healthy and other of us are very emotionally unhealthy. Just like there are many of us that are physically healthy and there are many of us that are physically unhealthy. And one of the ways that we prepare ourselves to be able to deal with the emotional side of life is to improve our emotional health. And just as there are diet and exercise realities that can improve our physical health, there are diet and exercise realities in our approach to our emotional health. On the diet side, what are we reading? What are we watching? What are we listening to? What are we talking about? Are we influencing our mind just with the latest gossip or the news of the day or whatever? Or are we learning how to improve the way we think, the way that we approach things, keeping things in perspective, those kind of things? What are, we, what are we putting in our minds? What are we filling our minds with? You've heard me reference Philippians 4 before, but it's so important and it fits perfectly into this context. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. This is about the things that we put in our minds. And the first part of this is all about the diet of, of things that we put into our minds. And then the second half of this gets into the exercise side of things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. That's, that's the, the exercise side of managing or learning how to be emotionally healthy. There are skills that we can learn and practice that can help us to manage our emotions. It starts with understanding their power and their place. Never underestimate the power of emotion. Emotions are powerful, particularly negative ones. Left on their own to grow and fester, they can get out of control and become destructive. And then we need to know their place. And I think this is critically important. We need to keep our emotions in perspective because if we can do that, they can be used to drive us and motivate us, but they must be subservient to our wills. So our emotions are in the mind space, okay, right? They can overwhelm what we're thinking and how we're acting, and the decisions that we make, but our wills need to supersede our emotions, our intentional thoughts and decisions, not the other way around. That's how we grow in our emotional health using diet and exercise. Now, these last two, our relational health and our spiritual health, um, they kind of round out these four areas of, uh, that we need to work on in our pursuit of holistic health. But I'm going to unpack those last two uh, as we close out the message today. So I'm not going to dive into them right now. But the diet and exercise MO works in these realms as well. The things that we digest, that we bring into our relational and spiritual mind and heart matter. And then the way that we exercise those skills, gifts, traits, the things that we are learning, hopefully on the positive side of things, on the healthy side of things, matter. 
garbage in, garbage out in all four of these areas. Exercising in the wrong way can hurt us. That simple concept of a healthy diet and healthy exercise brings all of these four arenas, our physical, our emotional, our relational, and our spiritual health, to levels that allow us to navigate this life well and to put ourselves in a position where we can manage the temptation of loneliness when it comes at us. There are inputs and outputs, perspectives, ideas, mindsets, actions, and activities that can contribute to our, either contribute to or erode our health in these arenas. And if I take a moment to rearrange these four items, you might recognize something. When Christ is asked his opinion of the greatest command, this is where he goes. Now I've got them in this order, relational, spiritual, emotional, and physical. And if you're looking at the screen with me, for those of you that are listening audio only, there is a biblical word that goes next to each one of those. Relational is equal to heart. Spiritual is our soul. Emotional is our mind. Physical is our strength. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. When Christ is asked his opinion of the greatest command, this is where he goes. He says we are to the lo love the Lord our God with all of our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength. Or in today's conversation, with all of our relational health, with all of our spiritual health, with all of our emotional health, and with all of our physical health, we are to love the Lord our God. This, along with the second greatest command of loving our neighbors, sums up all the law and the prophets. These two commands sum up all the law and the prophets. This is a huge deal. The impact of getting these two right covers over everything else. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I believe these four arenas that Jesus highlights in his reply to, in Mark chapter 12 are the key to navigating this life well. These are the four areas that Jesus says, this, you need, we need to love the Lord our God in all of these areas. And to do that, we need to be healthy in those areas. If we can bring holistic health to these four arenas, and honor God by presenting them to him in love, we will be able to, among other things, be able to be alone at the line while fighting the temptation of loneliness. Now, our time is running short, but the second strategy that I believe would be helpful is for us to lean intensely into relationships. Now, again, I told you I was going to unpack those last two relationships, uh, 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 relational health and spiritual health. And they kind of wrap up in th this last uh, strategy. But we need to really lean into relationship. First of all, relationship with God. We need to lean into our relationship with God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. And you might expect that from me as a preacher and a, a message on Sunday morning. I get that. But this particular relationship is critical for the success of all the others. And no, we don't have a lot of scripture reference in today's message. I, I realize that. But that's because we're spending more time outlining the problem than we are the solution. And now we're getting into solution mode for what it's worth. And I wanted us to understand the need and then get to this point to bringing in the solution. And in my humble opinion, as a, a preacher of the gospel and as a proponent of the sovereignty of God and the supremacy of Jesus Christ, I believe it all starts here in our relationship with God. Spending time with him, reading his word, learning his approach to the world and, and how he see, sees things. 
And we've attached the label to that called a biblical worldview. I don't, have a, I don't want to have a political worldview. I don't want to have an American worldview. I don't want to have, in my case, a middle-aged white male worldview. Think of all the different worldviews that people can have based on their upbringing, based on their schooling, based on their experiences. And I'm here to tell all of us and to embrace myself the fact that the worldview that we should have is the worldview of God's. And that comes through having a deep growing relationship with him. We listen to his word and we don't just say, oh, that's nice. Or we don't buck it and say, I don't agree with that. When we're in relationship with the creator of the universe, the one that gave us breath in our lungs and brought us to life, we need to respect his worldview because he created it. And, to be, and, and where I'm going with that is not this dictatorial, hey, get in line with God, even though I do believe there's, there's a lot of truth to that. It's the fact that there are many things in this life that just don't make sense. Unless you look at them from a biblical worldview. And there are still things that don't make sense, and even things in the Bible that I haven't quite made sense of yet. I have to properly admit that. But so much does make sense as I learn more and more about God. And I have a deepening relationship with Him. We have got to lean heavily into our relationship with God if we're going to bolster up our health and be ready for the onslaught of emotions that face us, that hit us. Particularly right now, this one we're talking about, this emotion of loneliness. The second relationship that we need to lean hard into. This may make sense to you. You probably, okay, yeah, relationship with others. Right, I need to have friends. Okay. We all know this, right? This, this isn't rocket science. I'm not trying to be, this, you have this great revelation. But I, what I think we have to be careful of here, and I want to be very sensitive and uh, appreciate the fact that we're all on different journeys and we're all in different places right now. But this is one I believe that we need to keep on the front burner, always actively pursuing. Because we live with a bunch of other humans. And if there's anything that I know about our human nature is we are fallen, fallible people. We make mistakes. We burn bridges. We do stupid stuff. And in order to be in relationship with two broken human beings, there has to be a lot of forgiveness. There has to be a lot of pursuit. There has to be a, a biblical worldview of love that overlooks all of that brokenness and sin and continues and continues and continues to pursue. Because the temptation, when we are alone, and that knock on the door of loneliness starts to be there. So we think nobody wants to be there. Nobody wants to talk to me. Nobody wants to call me. Nobody wants to come over and visit. And I realize there are restrictions in the way, but and we just start telling ourselves, we feed our hearts and our minds this negative train of thought. Rather than go on the offensive, if you will, and pursue relationship with others. And then we even get ourselves in this negative loop of, well, if they're not going to pursue me. I'm not going to pursue them. Why do I always have to do all the work? Because that's what relationship with other people takes. That's what it takes because we're all broken and we're all distracted and we're all on our own journey and we are all tempted to feel alone. But we all have to build up our exercise side of things. We have to work on what's 
what we're feeding our minds about our relationship with others for one. And then we need to learn to exercise what it means to be in relationship with other people that we love. And I'm the first to admit, I, I am terrible at phone calls. I am terrible at it. I don't take a lot of time to sit down and write notes either. And I'm the pastor. <laughs> so I get it. I understand it. But we have to fight the temptation to think that any of that's intentional. And we have to take ownership of it. And I believe we need to be assertive in reaching out to other people and building those relationships. Now, in the absence of those, if the first one is healthy, if our relationship with God is really healthy, then we can ride through that. And we can call people and find out they're busy and realize, oh, I'll call back, well, I'll call back another time and continue to bring exercise into those skill sets that can help us to build relationships with one another. The third area of relationship that I believe we should work on through diet and exercise is our relationship with ourselves. This is one I believe gets often overlooked. We might, okay, I get, I get the need for a relationship with God, okay? I, I consider myself a Christian. I believe in Jesus. <clears throat> I've been forgiven. Uh, God created me. You understand those basics of a, that biblical worldview. And God is always there, right? That's what he tells me. He promises he will never leave us or, or forsake us. Um, so he's always there. It doesn't feel like it all the time, but I get that why it's on the list. And of course, I get why others are on the list because that's the relationship we naturally think about. And when we have our friends and our family and our, our extended network and all of that stuff, those relationships, I get that. Why is self on here about relationships? Why is this relationship so important? Do you remember um, when, for those of us that have been parents, um, I, I wonder sometimes if this is lost on, on the current uh, generation of young parents, uh, but I get it. I don't mean to be critical. Uh, things evolve, and I, I don't want to be a back in my day guy again. But uh, when when we were first raising Anna, it was important for us to help her to do two things: to learn to go to sleep on her own, and to learn to play on her own. Now, does that mean we never read her a story at night or came in and comforted her when she cried? No. Does that mean we never played with her on the floor or took her to a park or those kind of things or had let her play with friends? No. But what it does mean is we appreciate the fact that this is an important skill in life to be able to be alone and be okay. Especially for a young child to be able to put themselves to sleep. But we also knew that there are times in life when you're going to be bored and you got to figure out something to do. We have to entertain ourselves. We have to be okay with being by ourselves. And so we try to instill some of that early on in her life. And I try to, I try to model it myself. And I get it. Some of us are extroverts and some of us are introverts. And I'll get all that conversation. Okay. But the fact remains that there are times in our lives when we will be alone, either by choice or by chance. And we need to learn to develop a healthy relationship with ourselves. What do we think about when we're alone? What do we read? What do we watch? What do we, what do we, what do we interact with in our brains? You know, I, what do we do then? How do we exercise our times alone? Now, you might think that I'm an extrovert, and on all the personality scales, I do come out at least on that side of the scale. But sometimes I wonder if I'm not a closet introvert because I do appreciate the times that I have to be alone. I remember when I was in high school, I got an opportunity um, to go to Europe to play on a musical tour. I played the tuba. I was with what they called the American Musical Ambassadors. And we toured seven countries, played 21 concerts, uh, 
No, we were there 21 days, had seven concerts. That was it. Uh, in seven different countries. And it was, it was amazing. And I remember when we were in West Germany. Uh, now, for those of you that are younger, there used to be two Germanys, so a West Germany and an East Germany. And we were in West Germany. And uh, across from the hotel where we were staying, there was this absolutely gorgeous park. And I was one of the younger ones on the trip. I was only 15 at the time. Most of them were uh, 17, 18, and even some, a lot of college students. So I didn't really fit in very well with a lot of the people that I was with. So I found myself alone quite often. I remember taking a walk through that garden, this beautiful park, absolutely gorgeous. I, to be honest, it, in my 15 years of life at that point in time, I'd never seen anything like that in the States. And it was just a park across the street. Beautiful, manicured, intentional. I just remember that, that, that soul-filling walk. I remember doing much of the same when we were able to visit the Louvre. And when I was walking around Venice. Again, often by myself. I remember one night, I was able to escape and go see the Eiffel Tower. Just incredible experiences now of course those are european and yada yada, yada. you know what else i enjoy doing over my lunch hours finding a local uh path and taking a hike whether that be a detweiler or black ridge black park ridge park or there's some uh, paths in Pekin that i'm learning to discover right now um forest park nature center even in the winter time what a gorgeous time to just go out and take a hike and in these times is when I'm continuing to exercise and bring in diet of thinking the right things about my relationship to myself. Because there's not always going to be people around me. And in my relationship with myself, when I am alone, I also that I'm really not alone. So when I'm going on those hikes, I can have a conversation with God because he is always there. Again, as I said earlier, there are times in our lives where either by choice or by chance, we will find ourselves alone at the line. And loneliness can often be just around the corner when that happens, tempting us to fall into her clutches. There are a number of cases where this came into play, even in the Bible. Hagar and Ismael and Genesis 21, Leah in Genesis 29, Miriam in Numbers 12, Elijah, Jeremiah, King David. I'm reading through the Psalms right now, and there are just a number of Psalms when you're just like, whoa, he is really lonely right now, feeling forsaken. Every, nobody, I'm just... Our, our, the Psalm 142 that we read today dipped into this fact. There's nobody at his right hand. He's all by himself. And even Jesus at the cross, when finally it got to that point where there had to be separation and he exclaimed, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Let's just say that in this temptation, you and I are in good company. But there are some core strategies that can help us when we are confronted with this temptation of loneliness. We can diligently pursue a holistic health in the arenas of our hearts and our souls and our minds and our bodies. These four key arenas that Christ called out in our love toward God and we can develop our relationship skills with God and with others and even with ourselves. We can concentrate on the diet and exercise components in those areas and realize that if we can get those right, if we can feed our hearts, minds, souls, and bodies the right things, if we can exercise our hearts, minds, and bodies in, and souls in the right ways, if by God's grace we could learn to master these strategies in our lives, 
it can go a long way toward the life to the full that Christ promised us. That's what Christ wants for us. Jesus wants us. He came so that we could live life to the full. I've heard it said that Jesus didn't come to make good men, bad men good. He didn't come so that we as his children would go from bad to good in our behavior. Jesus came to take dead men and women and give them life. That's the reason that Christ came. To bring the dead to life, not to move the bad, from the bad to the good. And in order for us to embrace the life that, to the full that Jesus promises us, I think we need to get these arenas in order through proper diet and exercise. This would give us an increased level of immunity when it comes to the negative emotions that seek to overcome us overcome us even in these days right now when there are external circumstances that are so beyond our control whether it be our cautious approach to a world that is covered in pandemic or some governmental edict that is imposing on our ability to be in relationship it doesn't matter i believe that christ is giving us insight into the arenas of health that we need to have if we're going to be able to manage those things well. May God's grace and mercy abound as we continue to seek Him in the midst of these difficulties. I love you guys, and I just, I so much want us to understand and embrace the power of having this kind of an understanding of what God wants, what I believe God wants for us in this life. And the I don't, I don't want to use the word solutions because it sounds like some packaged formula. But the gifts of understanding and, and ways of development that he offers us as we Learn and grow in our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength. Would you please pray with me as I close today? Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life that we live because of you. We thank you for the gift that you have given us in our life. And Father, I just, I realize that some of this feels like it's out of our control. The, the concept of chronic pain comes to my mind. Many of us know someone, or we are that person that is currently dealing with chronic pain. Or something that is severely impa impacting us in one of these four areas. An emotional trauma, a physical trauma, a spiritual trauma a relational trauma that gets in the way of our ability to be healthy in that area. And Father, I, I get that and I understand that and, and I would ask for your grace and your mercy and the fact that maybe in the other areas of our life we could become even more stronger, more strong that might overcompensate for this one area that is just so difficult to overcome. And my prayer, Father, is for your supernatural healing for any one of us that are suffering in one of those four areas. And Father, we can call many of them by name. We know who, who they are, we, and we know if it's us. And my prayer, Father, would be that you would grant your grace and your mercy, not only to the ones that are ailing in that arena, but for those of us that are walking alongside them, trying to bring comfort and patience and peace and love, use us as your children, Father, as, as your, um, your hands and your feet as we walk along this life with one another. Forgive us where we fall short. Give us hope. Give us light. Give us perspective. 
And God, help us to realize that some of those things we have to go out and get too. That we have to lean into our relationship with you and with others and even with ourselves. Bring in the right mindsets and the right exercises to help us to grow and be healthy to the best of our ability, even notwithstanding some of the chronic nature of the pains in our lives. We love you, God. Thank you for the blessing of life. We ask for your grace and mercy to be around us and in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That was definitely something that I wanted to mention during our time together. And I'll just, in closing, I will mention it again. Is that I, I, I get it that there are some things that are affect our lives so acutely in one of these four areas. And the idea of chronic pain comes to mind immediately because I know there's someone in our audience right now that is dealing with serious chronic pain. I have a friend of ours that, that lives in Arizona that has a very, very rare disease and chronic, chronic pain. It's very difficult to live this life in the midst of chronic pain. We also know people that are emotionally, chronically affected by emotional trauma. Or someone who's been affected severely by relational trauma. I'm, in no way is this conversation today meant to minimize any of those things. And that's why I said there are some times where definitely professional help is needed. For many of us, the onus is on us to strengthen ourselves in these areas, to find the right diet and exercises that are gonna help us to bring health so that we might be able to walk alongside one another in this world, learning to grow in our relationship with God and being okay with being alone as well. Love you guys, and I look forward to our next conversation together. Blessings to you all.